Once upon a time, many years ago, in the country of Japan, outside a small village, there lived deep in a mountain cave, a dragon. His fierce eyes shone out of the darkness like two bright lights, except when he fell asleep. He was a very serious dragon and tried to practice fire breathing every day, especially in the winter, because it made the air so warm, the trees would bloom, and, and he loved the flowers. Often, the dragon tried to visit the village, but everyone was very by him, except one little boy. The boy would dream about what fun it would be to have a dragon for what time to have together. Almost time for the little boy's birthday, his mother asked, oh, whom would you like to invite to your birthday party? The dragon. Mr. Dragon. What's the matter? Who's coughing? Tomorrow is my birthday, and, and there'll be lots of good things. So please come to my party. I, I came all the way just to invite you. I'm the dragon of the hills, and all tremble at the sight of me. I would very much like you to come to my birthday party, Mr. Dragon, if you can. Well, I'm the dragon of the hills, and all tremble at the sight of me. Please, Mr. Dragon, please come to my birthday party. I'm the dragon. You want me to come to your birthday party? I, I've never been invited anywhere before. dragon's tears flowed and flowed until at last they became a river. Then the dragon said, Come, climb on my back, and I'll give you a ride home. And as the boy bravely rode the dragon down the river of tears, a piece of magic took place. And he sailed all the way home as the captain of a dragon's steamboat. My name is John Cordy. I've been working in films almost 30 years. 
and most people know me for live action work like the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. Actually I started in animation and uh, when I was 16 years old I got fascinated by animation and I've done it a little bit all along but we've just recently finished a full-length animated feature called Twice Upon a Time and it has to do with fantasy and reality it has to do with uh, being in the stream of time or out of it and whether fantasy lands are better than reality. I was never satisfied making animated films in the traditional Disney way, so I invented along the way a process called, that we now call Lumage, and we used several years of short work for Sesame Street and other smaller projects to really refine and, and perfect this technique. On the other hand, uh, we felt that only a feature film would really show it to the world. The standard method of producing animation involves thousands of drawings. It's a gargantuan in task and, and involving a huge assembly line of people, inkers, painters, opaquers, so forth. In the Lumage process, the creative burden is much more on the individual artist. We design a set of characters that are made up of cut-out modular parts so that to make any one character move is really a matter of mathematically sometimes recombining those cutouts. And this means that we can't use an assembly line approach. Since we did use electronics and computers and all sorts of hardware on this project, most of which had to be custom designed and built for us, it was important to have a technical director or supervisor that was up to that variety of tasks. And we were very lucky to find John Baker in the Bay Area. He has backgrounds in all of those areas and supervised the design and the building of our special Lumage animation stands. used to be in the old days, if you wanted to do a move, you'd have to sit there with a crank and crank it a little bit and shoot a frame and then crank it a little bit more and shoot another frame. Whereas these days, um, we're, I mean, we're essentially using the same technology that George Lucas and his people use in creating all the special effects for Star Wars, which is we have computers essentially um, figure out these moves or help us to figure out these moves and then they actually execute them. Um, as you can see, I'm just talking with a computer keyboard and it's then taking my instructions and executing that into a move. The other uh, aspect of my live action work that I was able to integrate into this film was to take the improvisational approach to the acting. And I did a film years ago called Funny Man with people at the committee and I got to know how that second city and committee kind of improvisational cabaret system works. And I felt that when it works it's f far funnier than any lines that I can write or anybody else can write. And so our approach on this film was to block out the story, to develop a very real structure, but it, and we wrote 14 drafts of the script, but all of those drafts were taken into the recording studio and the pages were handed to the actors and we said, okay, read it from the paper a couple of times and after that, just go with the scene. Just do it your way. Even an animated film has to have a villain, of course, and our villain is synonymous botch played by Marshall Efren. Marshall is very experienced in improvisation, and after a while, all we had to do was to start him in a certain direction, and he would run with the scene. We have about seven or eight actors in this film, and they're heard but not seen. They're all very experienced at improvisation, and I think, in fact, they may be some of the best improvisational actors in the United States. One of the best is Judy Kahn, who plays the fairy godmother. And one of the best scenes in the film is her introduction of herself to the heroes. Many people are aware that San Francisco is becoming more and more of a 
film center, uh, not necessarily the center, but at least an alternative center for film production. But what's interesting is that in the beginning, we were very afraid of our difficulties that we might have in finding enough cartoonists, animators, artists to work on this film. Once we got into it, we found them all over the place. We had people who left Disney to come here. We had people from New York. But we had 30 or 40 people from the Bay Area who all had good experience and lots of talent. And in some cases, we hired people on a Wednesday morning, uh, interviewed them at 9 o'clock, hired them at 10 o'clock, and put them to work at 11 under a camera. So there was a lot of talent involved in this film and a lot of hard work. and. A lot of people just jumped right into the process and started swimming. The producer of the film, Bill Couturier, came to our company from a background of documentary work, animation work to some degree, and also a lot of business training. And he brought these skills together very well and supervised all of the editorial and sound mixing aspects. Something a lot of people are curious about is how you get the animation to synchronize with the voices. And a lot of people assume that you animate and then do the voices. That's not at all how it's typically done. Normally what you do is way before anything is animated, but once you have your character designs and know what your story is going to be, your screenplay, you go in and record the voice tracks. And in our case, we used a group of primarily improvisational actors, all of whom we loved dearly, and we had a lot of fun recording the tracks, which, although production of the film took over two years, the basic vocal tracks we recorded in about two weeks. Julie Payne uh, played Flora Fauna, and she got to play a parody of an actress herself. Chuck Swenson came to us just after leaving a partnership which was called Murakami, Wolf, and Swenson in Los Angeles, involved very much in animation for years and years, and brought to it a kind of experience with cartoons in a pure entertainment sense that many of us didn't have. Generally, I'd draw up a storyboard, um, bring it to the uh, animators and artists that were to work on that portion of the picture, uh, we'd pick it all apart. Um, John would put his input in. We'd put it all back together again. It would go off to start getting itself done. People brought other ideas to it. Once the character is established and uh, some action is figure out <clears throat> what he's going to do in that scene, then the job falls to the animator to, to uh, bring those drawings to life to change them from drawings into uh, the actual cutouts. You go under camera, put the little pieces together, the film is shot, you sit down at dailies and uh, everybody looks at what you've done. There's no chance to take it back and say, oh no, I didn't mean that. No, he's, ah. You're stuck with what you did. Rod Rescue Man, for instance, uh, came out of our past consciousness. Uh, Jim gave us Rod Rescue Man's voice. Rod was meant to be based on all of our conception of a superhero, and this was to be a bumbling one. Twice Upon a Time was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for all of us. It was a huge amount of work. We would probably do it again, but not in the next two or three weeks.